Good afternoon, and thank you all for joining us for the Establishing a More Flexible Grid Opportunities in Providing Flexibility webinar. News related to the energy sector has dominated the media in recent weeks, with the rise in consumer bills and fuel prices contributing to the increased cost of living and volatility in wholesale gas prices, driven by a range of factors, including the deplorable invasion of Ukraine by Russia. With the energy security strategy launched last week, the plans to launch a future system operator to oversee the energy networks unveiled, the launch of the 65 million flexibility innovation program and the growing push towards renewables. The need for flexibility has never been so important. Um, so just before I hand over to Farina to kick us off on expanding on the ENA's work on flexibility and the open networks program, I'd quickly like to invite all of our viewers um, to put any questions that you may have for any of our panelists in the question box at the bottom right of your screen. But without further, in, further ado, um, Farina, would you be able to introduce us to the ENA's work in flexibility and the open networks program? Thanks, Molly. Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to see so many of you joining our session today. I'm Farina Farrier. I'm the head of Open Networks here at the Energy Networks Association. So if we just go to the next slide. Um, so uh, next slide, please. So by way of introduction, ENA is the trade association that represents electricity and gas networks in the UK and in Ireland. Sorry, just the slide before, please. Um, so basically, like, you know, we essentially represent the companies that own and operate the wires and pipes that are bringing energy into our homes. So we act as the voice of the energy sector and essentially we are providing a platform to discuss and address key topics that are impacting our sector. So on behalf of our members, we are leading a number of key initiatives and open networks is one of them that I'll be talking to you about. Um, if you just go back to um, slide three, please. So I think before we, yeah, thank you. So I think before we, I guess before I talk to you a little bit more about open networks, I always just like to briefly touch on the energy landscape and I guess the context behind, um, you know, open, us setting up open networks. So I think over the last few years, we've seen that unprecedented change across the energy sector. This is mainly driven by decentralization and the need for decarbonization. So more recently, we have seen the UK government committing to world leading climate change targets. And in last year, there was a commitment to fully decarbonize our power system by 2035. Now, this is something that, you know, these are big commitments, and this is really something that will require a fundamental shift across the system. And as part of that system, energy networks really have a key role to play in helping to achieve those ambitions. So traditionally, you know, the electricity networks have really been one way power systems, and there's really a need for these for the networks to become more smart and flexible to be able to accommodate more renewables and and basically to help accommodate the increase in demand that we are going to be seeing in the years to come so ena is really playing a key role in helping to bring the networks together to navigate this transition um, we are working alongside the broader industry government and off in helping to deliver our net zero ambitions so recently you know we have seen the government positions on on the energy security strategy institutional arrangements such as the future system operator and i think that will you know these are topics we'll touch on as part of our panel session today as well but i think broadly like in this in this energy landscape you know there is a lot of change it's coming really quickly and coordination is really going to be fundamental to make sure that you know we are working together in achieving our net zero ambitions so go to the next slide please so really, like with that background and context in mind, you know, Open Networks was started back in 2017. So like essentially the project is looking at leading that transition from that one way power system that I talked about earlier to that smart and flexible energy system that's very much needed for the future. Um, so over the through the work that we've done over the years, we have gained good momentum and, you know, we are helping to progress the changes that are needed to get the networks um, net zero ready. So in order to deliver the transition, you know, we've broadly focused on four different areas across open networks. So if you just go to the next slide, please. Yep, this here, yeah, thank you. So the first area, the one before, that's slide four. Yep, so I think the first area being flexibility. So, um, so flexibility is obviously a core, you know, it's a key part of that transition. So we are helping to open up local markets for flexibility that will enable more active 
management of the networks and most efficient use of the system. Um, you know, secondly, we are looking at connections and ways in which we can help customers connect faster to the network. Um, thirdly, we're looking at data and we're looking at, you know, how we can open up data for customers, you know, to enable them to identify best locations for them to be citing their assets in. Um, additionally, we're also looking at opening up data more widely to the industry to help, you know, like, I guess, new and innovative use cases for that, uh, for that data that will ultimately help deliver benefits for um, for customers. And lastly, you know, we are looking at delivering efficiencies, you know, by looking at more coordinated ways of working across, you know, different network companies and in different sectors. Um, and then in terms of delivering all of this work that and, and these four, you know, core priority areas that I've just set out, you know, we are like in, our approach has always been to work collaboratively with the industry and in, in making sure that this is, you know, a transparent and a fair transition for all parts of society. Through our work, we are helping to drive standardization and simplification. I think a key aspect that I'd like to talk a bit more about is you know, our, our learn by doing approach. I think what we essentially mean by that is, you know, it's it's not I guess that's not really us um I, you know doing a desktop exercise. We are working quite closely with projects on the ground to test some of the approaches that we are developing and to then take those learnings on board and incorporate them as part of our work. And I think as part of that learn by doing approach, innovation projects really have quite a key role to play. And, you know, we worked with a number of them over the years. And as, I think as Molly mentioned um, earlier in the intro as well, some of you may be aware of this, you know, Bayes have recently launched a 65 million innovation program to support large scale system flexibility. And, and this basically includes, you know, smart and opportunities for smart energy applications such as, you know, vehicle to everything or automatic asset registration. And, you know, in, 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 innovative initiatives such as this, you know, they are going to be really critical in helping us push the traditional boundaries and, and helping us to find innovative ways of navigating the transition. So we'll share some further um, information of, on that in the chat. So I think, in, as I mentioned on the previous um, slide as well, I think basically like you know, the, our work is really driven by the net zero agenda and the mandate. So last year we saw the smart systems and flexibility plan come out. So that's basically set out all the actions that are required of the broader industry to deliver that smart and flexible energy system. So this has been like a key area of focus for us and that has really, um, you know, been driving our work plan. So if you go to slide five, please. Um, so I think broadly like as I mentioned, you know, the smart systems plan, it, it cuts across the industry and, you know, it's got a number of actions there. It's, it's got a number of actions for open networks as well. And this has really been, you know, quite instrumental in informing our work plan for this year. Um, a key area of focus for us really is for this year, it's to help, you know, establish these local markets for flexibility in a coordinated way. And, and as part of that, we are going to be delivering a common framework for flexibility services by 2023. Um, and I think, you know, and, and another point, I, I guess, to note, you know, we have seen some of the ongoing work from Offsham and Bayes around institutional arrangements, you know, governance, roles and responsibilities. So, you know, we see the Open Networks Project having a key role in helping to inform and support these ongoing reviews. So if we just come finally to um, slide six. So, um, so basically, I guess, just to kind of recap where we are in terms of, you know, flexibility here in Great Britain. So reflecting on the last five years, we have made substantial progress, you know, in the flexibility space. So a recent study, um, you know, commissioned uh, by Geoard has shown that, you know, UK has some of the largest flexibility markets in Europe. So I think with, with that, I guess, you know, th that's, you know, that's a really good position for us to be in, you know, that is good progress, but our work doesn't end here. And there is really much more for us to do this year and in the coming years to really help, you know, reap the full benefits of flexibility. So I think that's that's all I want to say as part of the intro. And I'll just stop at that and um, look forward to the panel session. So I'll hand back over to Mali. Thanks, Verena. That was a really great introduction. Um, I'd now like to invite all of our panelists to quickly introduce themselves and sort of talk a little on how their work fits into the dis the flexibility discussion. Um, Jamie, I wonder if you could kick us off with that. Uh, 
Hi there. Um, I hope I've now come off mic. All my controls vanished there for a second, uh, but if you can all hear me, that's uh, that's great. Uh, so my name is Jamie Adam. I'm the project manager for Ripple Energy. Um, I joined the company last year after 13 years with Community Energy Scotland, where I helped community groups and our trading subsidiary develop a number of uh, generation and flexibility projects. So that's included working with SB Energy Networks on their ARC project in the Scottish borders and developing uh, flexibility and storage opportunities in the Western Isles. Uh, some of you might have heard of Ripple. We've had a few appearances in the Telegraph and, and the Times in the past few days. We're a relatively new company, but growing quickly. And what we're really passionate about is making clean energy ownership affordable and accessible for everyone, regardless of where you live. So the way that we achieve that is by building consumer-owned uh, cooperative wind farms, which deliver direct savings for our members on their energy bills. Uh, we've partnered with a number of energy suppliers, including Octopus, Co-op Energy, E.ON, and So Energy. And anyone who's an existing uh, customer of one of those suppliers or willing to switch to them can become a member of the wind co-ops we develop. So the way that it works is that consumers decide how much they want to purchase, which can be as little as £25, and they pay this up front. Once the uh, wind farm is up and running, our uh, supplier partners then buy the electricity uh, generated at the stable, low operating cost of the wind farm, which normally works out at about two pence per kilowatt hour. This is much lower than the normal wholesale cost of uh, energy that suppliers would pay, obviously. And so they pass on the difference to members as a reduction in their energy bill. Um, now, only 30 to 40 percent of consumer bills are normally made up of wholesale costs, of course, um, although that proportion is a lot higher at the moment. Uh, so your energy won't be free, but if your share of the wind farm's generation covers 100 percent of your electricity consumption, then we estimate it could reduce your electricity bill by around uh, 25 percent over the wind farm's lifetime. So this is a really simple but really innovative model. Um, other wind cooperatives have been developed before, but the Ripple model is the only one that directly saves members money on their energy bills and uh, crucially helps to stabilize their electricity costs. So our first turbine is a two and a half megawatt Vensys 100 uh, at Great Vatha in South Wales, which has just started generating last month. Uh, the Great Vatha cooperative has over 900 members. They're all uh, fantastic pioneering people who are incredibly enthusiastic about owning their own clean renewable generation. And in mid-February, we launched our second share offer for a much bigger site called Kirk Hill in South Ayrshire, um, which will have eight Enercon E92 turbines. And we've had a brilliant response to this so far with over 4,300 members signed up to date. Uh, and we've raised uh, over £9 million uh, from them alongside commitments from our, our co-investors for the site. So we've got a few weeks left for people to invest and we'll be starting construction around mid-July this year. Consumer engagement in flexibility is a real area of interest for us and I'm looking forward to talking about some of our work and aspirations uh, around this in the session today. Hello, um, I'm Alistair Martin. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer of Flexicricity. Uh, Flex Electricity has been going for um, 18 years now. Um, uh, we went live four years after we were launched. It took a while to get everything together. Um, but uh, we've been running a 24 hour um, control room operating flexibility in the EP electricity market um, since then. And uh, we have um, quite a wider range of, of customers participating in, 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 in what we do. So our job is to find flexibility. Um, out there in the distribution networks, uh, in, in the form of flexible customers, uh, we start with industrial commercial. We will shortly also include uh, domestic in there, the public sector as well. Um, and we also work with merchant um, uh, power developers who work on small plants, uh, in, including uh, batteries and beakers. And we also work with combined heat and power um, uh, uh, generators and, and optimize their, their delivery. We believe that flexible energy resources in the distribution networks 
um, uh, are a, a great way to help put green energy to work. They're a great way to make the system flexible, um, provided they're properly deployed uh, in amongst various different acti activities and services that, that such flexibility can can, um, can provide. Um, and um, we uh, believe that uh, each resource has its own sweet spot, its own uh, its own really um, core type of flexibility that it can it can deliver, or perhaps a, a, in some cases a, a range of types of flexibility that it can deliver. So, for example, something like a large scale heat pump can deliver flexibility uh, in and around the heating need. Uh, so, for example, a, 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 a large scale heat pump has some thermal inertia, and um, within day, if you have a period where heating is required, you can adjust the timing, you can respond to events um, of the use of that heat pump, um, and uh, uh, you, can, um, you can be very flexible when, when, when something occurs. And one of the things that's often missed in discussing flexibility in, in electricity networks is that electricity uh, requires continual adjustment. It's, it's, it can't be stored in its native form, it's generated as it's consumed. And, 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 and therefore responding to events uh, rather than just simply responding to prices is, is extremely important. But of course, events drive prices, prices drive um, uh, uh, value, and our job is to provide value to our, our, our flexible customers. And doing that, we believe we're helping to green up the grid. We believe we're helping to put green energy, energy to work. And um, we, we are really pushing very hard in our regulatory engagement to try to achieve some of the things that um, Farina set out there um, uh, and, and in doing so to open up the flexibility market space to not just industrial commercial um, uh, and not just merchant but also domestic electricity users as I've, as I've, as I've, as I've said um, and community energy um, we think is an area that will, that will, that will grow as well um, because communities understand local resources and local capabilities and, uh, and the public sector as well. Um, all of these different actors have different contributions to make. Our job is to operate it 24-7 in our control room in Edinburgh and get it best value for the flexibility that it can provide. David, would you be able to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you. Uh, David Middleton from Origami Energy. Um, I'm a Strategic Account and Innovation Director. Uh, I'm very fortunate in that I head up the DNO's uh, consultancy team within Origami. And although Origami itself um, provides visibility of portfolios of assets and allows organizations to um, forecast what they're going to be doing in the future, in the near future, uh, and then optimize the use of those to deliver services and trading opportunities, what we're doing is we're working with two DNOs, um, Scottish Power and Energy Networks and Scottish and Southern Energy Networks, <coughs> sorry, electricity networks um, on on three innovation projects. Um, one is fusion with Scottish Power, and that's looking at trialing commodi sorry commoditized local demand side flexibility, um, which is using a structured form of rules called the U Universal Smart Energy Framework, which was developed in Europe, and that's looking to see how a rules based approach to allowing a flexibility market to work um, will operate. Um, we're working with Local Energy Oxfordshire, which is a project sponsored by Innovate UK, um, and that is focusing on the customer aspects and the competitive market aspects um, of <coughs> commoditized competitive markets. And that's working with a lot of organizations that have got assets that have either got a low amount of flexibility or are very small in their own right, um, including working with some uh, communities. And finally, we're working with Transition, again, through Scottish and Southern Energy Electricity Networks, um, focusing on the network assets, aspects of the DSO um, change and the operation of a commoditized competitive market. Um, that works closely with LEO. Um, and all three of those projects um, work in conjunction with the Open Networks project um, with Farina and the rest of the team at the ENA. Um, it's all a lot of it is looking at edge of grid issues, looking at how we can help new organ, new organizations come to market, how we can enable new flexibility, how we can operate, define and operate these marketplaces um, in order to get new services. And the exciting area we're looking at is also peer to peer services, which at the moment is based around capacity trading for those organizations who've got excess capacity, allowing them, enabling them to trade with other organizations in the same area um, on a short term basis. Um, projects are um, all still operating. Uh, Leo finishes uh, in March next year and Fusion and Transition finish in October next year. Thank you. 
Thanks, David, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, so to start off the panel discussion, the 2021 Smart Systems and Flexibility Plan showed a huge sign of progress towards the development of an intelligent and adaptive energy system, which the energy networks have already begun building. What kind of flexibility is emerging to meet the growing demand created by renewable growth? And is it moving fast enough? Um, Alistair, I don't know if you want to kick us off with that. I could start with, is it moving fast enough? And I think you would know the answer I would give. Um, <laughs> I, I would say the Smart Systems and Flexibility Plan 2, which is the one we're talking about, is a substantial improvement on, on, on version one, uh, which was something of a tick list of, of um, what appear to be more administrative items. This one has quite a bit of vision uh, baked into it. And um, uh, I, I was going through the various elements of the vision um, today and I, 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 as a refresher, and I, I, I couldn't find any that I didn't support. Um, the, the, the types of flexibility that I think the smart systems plan or in fact the, the overall suite of regulation um, needs to uh, advance, there are two kinds which are very, very important. Um, one of them is ad hoc flexibility and electricity users being flexible, generally speaking, have a day job or they have an activity that they want to do and they have variation in the capability of their, their resources. You can't flex an EV charger if the car is already full or is not plugged in um, and you can't flex a heat pump when the um, people to whom uh, that heat pump is supplying heat are not warm enough. You have to um, supply the heat as a priority. And so flexibility changes in, in uh, each resource changes the flexibility it's got to offer. The ability of those resources to offer flexibility is therefore contingent on ad hoc marketplaces being available to them. There are ad hoc marketplaces, the balancing mechanism is ad hoc, the intraday markets are, 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 are ad hoc. There's huge volume in those. There's plenty of volume for all of that flexibility to be remunerated and to be rewarded and for investment signals to be sent to, to um, uh, persuade people to do things like add on energy stores, which tend to be quite low cost if they're thermal and so forth. Um, the, the issue would be that um, the, the, the use of the balancing mechanism is uneven. Uh, and incomplete and access to intraday markets is awkward um, and uh, uh, not yet working working properly. There are moves afoot to address the latter. We're not there yet in terms of addressing the former. There's an awful lot that we would look to naturally the ESO to do there. Um, the other kind, I think, you know, uh, Farina covered it, is distribution scale flexibility. This is a huge area. It's where flexibility is really going to grow and it's going to be part of um, the use case that allows us to develop domestic flexibility uh, in, 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 into the market. Thanks, Alistair. David, I wonder if there's much more you'd want to add to that. Um, I would I would wholeheartedly agree with what Alistair's been saying and certainly through the projects we've been working with um, and looking at smaller assets and lower levels of flexibility embedded in communities, um, then that is an area for growth and certainly it is moving quite slowly at the moment because we're dealing with organizations where it very much is an add-on to what their day-to-day -day business is. They don't understand the electricity market. They don't know what flexibility is. They're eager to get involved, but they, they don't even know where to start half the time. Um, so certainly Project Leo and Transition have been working through uh, to provide user guides, working with local communities, um, to try and help them understand what opportunities might be. Um, I think as we get more and more um, certainly domestic side assets coming to market, there's scope for huge amounts of flexibility, you know, up to 20 gigawatts in total, albeit not all of that would be available at the same time. And that can help resolve a lot of localized issues, which is one thing that the, um, the smart flexibility paper did not really consider. It was looking at um, a higher level issues than that. So I think there's all to play for um, at the moment. I think we're still working out, feeling our way through what that means and how communities can work. And certainly we're working together with Low Carbon Hub, um, one of the project partners on um, Project Leo, to understand what how communities can work together as a group of um, MPANs um, to become a smart community-based energy organization. Thank you. Um, Farina, um, with this 20 gigawatts of flexibility target that David touched on, um, how has it been working with the ENA to drive forward this demand, this flexibility to meet the emerging demand? And do you think you're moving fast enough? Yeah. Yeah. So I guess when I first started at ENA, this was five years ago when Open Networks first started. I think in, in those days, flexibility was still very much, you know, 
I guess in, in its very early stages, we I think there were only very few companies that were procuring flexibility and it tended to be, you know, mostly in like the innovation stage. But I think looking at where we are today, you know, we've got around three gigawatts of flexibility as of last year that was put out to tender. So I think that growth has been quite substantial. Um, but I think as Alistair kind of touched on in his, intro, uh, in his intro as well, I think, you know, we've made good progress, but clearly like, you know, we need to be doing more. I think particularly most of the flexibility on the distribution side that we've been procuring tends to be, you know, at the 33 um, and 11 KV level, but the flexibility that we procure at an LV level it is still quite limited. And most of the people who are providing those services tend to be industrial and commercial customers. And, you know, the, there are, like we do have flexibility from limited, I guess some, you know, residential parties, but I think to be able to meet the ambitions that we've set out and to really, you know, I guess, you know, reap the full benefits of flexibility, we, we need to kind of really get more of that domestic level flexibility. I think particularly that will become even more important as you know we start to see more EVs and heat pumps and you know there's there's a lot of potential for providing demand side response at a residential level and I think that's really where our focus needs to be. Definitely. Um with there being both large scale and residential sources of flexibility, I suppose one of the biggest questions that still hangs around all of it is economically, what is the value of flexibility at the moment and how do we generate a market for it? Um, and also how much should it cost? Um, Alistair, could you kick us off with that? Um, I, I'm not absolutely sure I understood the question in terms of, uh, you know, what, 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 what should it cost? Because I, I, I think that the, um, uh, if I can track that back to a market where people can charge what they want, um, the, the, the question is the, 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 the buy curve versus the supply curve. And the, um, if we look, um, for example, into the, the recent, the recent um, dynamic containment market, which has been running for just over a year now and has sort of had some market tweaks to it. What you find is um, markets that briefly value flexibility extremely highly if it comes in a particular sort and then the value drops back again. Um, and, and so we're talking about uh, market structures and this is the sort of prevailing philosophy and I don't, I don't object to it in, 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 in most terms. Um, that um, a free market should have scarcity prices some of the time, but we should have cost prices uh, on or, as, or cost plus, um, in, uh, you know, moderate incentive as being the long term uh, number that, that things converge to. Now, how much are people actually making? Um, the, the the fastest and most nimble types of um, uh, flexibility uh, have consistently made one hundred and fifty thousand pounds per megawatt uh, uh, equivalent over the past year or so of, um, of high speed um, services. And basically though that, that money has been, has been achieved um, largely by batteries. But uh, it's worth noting that those batteries have been tempted out of those markets by um, uh, changes in, in, in the, the value of other markets. And so they've come out of the, 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 the otherwise pretty steady and, 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 and um, steady on average uh, frequency services and they've come out and they've done merchant activity in, in the intraday markets. And um, that's what that means is that there is value in the slower activities as well. And, and if we can um, achieve access for everybody into those markets, then they have potential to achieve, others have the potential to achieve their share of, of, of that value. Now, I am not going to say that somebody who's producing one megawatt of, of flexibility is going to earn £150,000 no matter what it is or one kilowatt is going to earn £150, no matter what it is. That's not the case. Um, it, it, it's, it's, it's actually much more difficult than, 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 than that to organize uh, or to, 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 to estimate. You have to look at each re resource. Um, but that tells you what the top end is um, and, and the, the, the bottom end is your cost of provision. Um, because if it's not worth it for you to provide, then, then um, you won't be there. Um, we, uh, I would also say finally that it's very hard to calibrate um, right now because we are, and it's partly about this, I think one of the questions that came through in, 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 in the chat, um, we are right now in a massive cost of living crisis. Um, it is affecting consumers like no energy crisis that I've ever seen since, since entering the energy industry. I've never seen anything like this um, in terms of the scale, but also in terms of the, 
the stubbornness. Or these prices are persistent. They're sitting in the forward markets for, for a, a long way hence. It's not good news. Um, and uh, the, 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 that, that, that creates a ma massive policy tension, massive market tension. And, and um, we, can, we can say that people will make X if they enter this market now, but that's not well calibrated. There's tension here. Something's going to break at some point, and I don't know what, what when. I'm not quite sure what the change will be, whether it'll be a policy intervention. Um, but uh, uh, the, yeah, these are these are these are volatile numbers. Um, where we believe that people who aren't interested in volatile markets will gain value is in entering markets that might be volatile up from time to time, but they're they are on average consistent, and that's what we're looking for in the DSO markets and in um, ESO markets. We're looking for that track record to be established of regular procurement of the resources that are there when they're in the money. And if we can achieve that, um, then we can bring people into all those markets and the intraday, supported by the intraday, which is um, relatively consistent, um, that uh, uh, current gas prices uh, aside. I hope that answers the question. Uh, it, I, I tried to interpret it on the fly there, Molly. Thanks, Alistair. I suppose David, from the projects that you've worked on, uh, which involve consumers, how have you found the conversation with them about the value of flexibility at the moment and has it changed in recent months? Um, so the conversation Because uh, there's so much volatility in the market. Okay. Sorry, my apologies. Um, yeah, so the projects that we're working on are essentially divorced from the marketplace itself at the moment because they're within a project environment. Um, the prices that are paid are comparable to what's being paid in the marketplace. And what we're finding is those organizations who have smaller assets um, are not able to recover necessarily even the, the cost of participation in those auctions, let alone any cost for charging of EVs um, or for charging of a, a small battery. Um, so what the large, the large measures is coming out is that the value of flexibility is not enough. And I think there is an extra dimension to that, and that is when you look at how flexibility is rewarded, flexibility is rewarded to the person who buys it for the first person that gets the value from it. But when you deliver some flexibility, that delivers a value to your supplier, it delivers a, a value to the distribution network, to the, that's just the transmission network, to the local air quality and to the UK carbon footprint. And none of these are valued in that price that is paid. Um, the, the values you can get in the marketplace, as Alistair says, can go up to £150,000 a megawatt a year. Um, some Most of the DNO services tend to be somewhere between five and £9,000 a megawatt a year equivalent. But if you've got an EV that's got seven kilowatts, you're not getting an awful lot of money. And, and in all fairness, you shouldn't either. But I think we've got to look at how can we stack services, um, including adding those services to energy savings behind the meter, using your tariff as a structure to help encourage that. Um, because all assets are different, they've got different levels of flexibility, um, and they need to be able to deliver a suite of flexibility services at the edge of grid in order to encourage more flexibility to come to the market. And certainly the projects we've been working on are dealing with organizations who've never been participating in this area before. They don't understand the market. They don't understand what flexibility is. Um, there's been a lot of work going on to help them. They're now fully understanding of that. And we're getting into some really interesting work with them. And certainly as the, the trials progress, it will be even more beneficial to the market. Thank you. Thanks, David. Jamie, I wonder if there's anything you wanted to add on the value of flexibility at the moment, and also because I know you got cut off when we were talking on the first point about um, the emerging renewable growth and whether or not flexibility is rising to, fast enough to meet that, how Ripple Energy is viewing that and how you're tackling that. Yeah, absolutely. I think the, the first point has probably been fairly comprehensively covered by Alistair and David, but on the, um, on the value of flexibility, um, I think uh, I think the value is different depending on who you're talking about, and I I think uh, it can be quite challenging for domestic consumers to engage in that market. There are some very basic forms of flexibility out there in terms of um, time of use tariffs. Some of those are more basic and advanced than others. Even with 
static uh, rather than dynamic time of use. Um, there are tariffs out there at the moment which can save you nearly two thirds of uh, the cost of an overnight charge for your electric vehicle, for instance, compared to doing that at peak times. That's quite significant for, for consumers that, that can make a real difference. Um, I think another point worth making though is that it isn't it isn't all down to economics when we talk about value and for a growing number of consumers um, they have a, a genuine interest in flexing their use to align their demand with the periods of uh, lowest carbon generation on the grid um, particularly when they can actually point to a, uh, a uh, turbine that they own and be able to say I'm using energy that my turbine is generating right now. Uh, that's not going to be an incentive for everyone by any means, but for, for quite a large chunk of, uh, of consumers out there, um, the, the, the carbon aspect is becoming really quite significant as well. And so that's, that's definitely an added value stream, I would say. Thanks, Jamie. And I suppose next, what, if any, are the biggest barriers to the transition of Britain's electricity sector to a flexible green system? Farina, as the ENA kind of covers everything, uh, could you give yourself on that? Yep, happy to do that. I think at the moment, really, like, I guess this transition's not really just about the electricity sector. It cuts across a number of sectors. And I think, you know, from, from I think my view is that it, it's that coordination aspect which is really going to be very fundamental you know the the transition cuts across you know sectors such as transport buildings homes national infrastructure so i think we really need to kind of take a more holistic approach and you know i guess coordination is going to be quite a key enabler for us to make sure that we are kind of delivering the transition you know in an efficient and also in an effective way so i think that that's that's the one thing for me Thanks, Rena. David, are you coming up against the same sort of barriers in terms of coordination? Um, yes, I think one of the biggest barriers we're seeing is the structure of the marketplace. Um, if you go to a DNO to provide services, you flexibility services, you have to sign on to the, the, the nationally agreed flexibility services contract, which is a great thing to have in all fairness because it's a standardized agreement, um, but it's standardized where it's standardized. Um, there are nuances from every DNO, the language is the language of the marketplace. And I think the problem is the biggest barrier going forward is going to be that a lot of people are going to come into the market who don't understand it today. They don't speak the same language and they don't understand the complexity and they, they don't want to spend for a small organization, which could, what could end up being several thousands of pounds understanding a legal agreement. Now, a lot of those organizations may be best off going through an intermediary of some form uh, to get to market because they don't necessarily want the risks or the, the the work that goes with that um, but for others it's about how we make these markets more accessible whether that's standardization of contracts standardization of services you know across the ESO the DSO and uh, indeed through to peer-to-peer -peer services and other trading services um, make it more cost effective for people to enter that market um, and I think the other thing is we've talked about that earlier certainly Alistair and I raised the point which is about the value of flexibility is looking at it what is a fair price for flexibility and it's not just the price that's paid by the ESO or by the DSO but how do we get a fairer price for flexibility in GB thank you Thanks, David. Alistair, are there any other barriers that you're running up against? Well, the, the, yeah. Um, one of these is, is um, just a, a, a statement that uh, there, are, there are some people in, in uh, the industry who think that there is time to spend debating and, and considering options. Um, we've done that. It is time to get the heck on with this. There's, there's, um, there's clear paths forward. Um, I, was, I was heartened by um, the previous use of the phrase learning by doing. Um, something that um, the, the National ESO has been uh, saying uh, recently, and we fully support that. That is now the only way um, to, 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 to get on. Um, the, the other thing, I think actually I'm probably addressing a question that came in from, from Lauren Jouse, if I said the name right. Um, uh, in terms of barriers in the balancing mechanism in particular, uh, so uh, Lauren mentioned um, BM wider access. If I can just pick that one up as a, as, as a barrier. BM wider access has been, has, has been created, removing a barrier, um, allowing uh, uh, people to participate in the balancing mechanism without necessarily having to change supplier. 
and that's that's a, that's a very positive thing. However, the issue is about positive negative. If you're selling positive energy into the balancing mechanism, um, you do so at something of a premium under the current BLP or virtual lead party arrangements, the BM wider access arrangements. If you're selling negative energy, which is extremely important in high renewable periods or low demand periods, you do so at a, at a, at a, with a substantial discount on the value to you. And this is to do with an unevenness in those arrangements. Um, you do not have any access in that form to the, to the wholesale intraday markets. Um, there is a move to correct both of those um, issues. It's presently gone off to be um, debated again, and that's cost another year on implementation of those two changes. We really can't afford that kind of thing. We, 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 we have to be getting on. So hopefully I've picked up um, Lauren's question and, and answered the one you asked at the same time. Yeah, thanks, Alistair. Um, so as much as there are clearly bar barriers, there's a huge opportunity in the flexibility space as well. Um, so how are or can communities work together to tackle the increasing cost of energy along with the need to expand renewables and flexibility? Jamie, I wonder if you could start. Yep, absolutely. Um, so we've seen some great initiatives um, from community groups over the years, and there's there's a lot of examples of community generation. Um, uh, although the economics of that kind of model have undoubtedly been um, a, a lot more challenging since the end of the feed-in tariff, I would say. Um, there have been a number of community-based uh, demand side management schemes as well um, and uh, in my my previous role i was involved in a number of those i would say though that um at a, at a community level and uh, particularly when trying to integrate domestic customers um, you are quite restricted still by technical and regulatory difficulties in uh, integrating flexibility into those kind of um, properties. One example as a as a kind of notable issue that that we faced was um, simply the the lack of manufacturers uh, making reliable devices to actually communicate with and uh, and control domestic loads. Um, and it's certainly uh, a lot more challenging when you're looking at um, millions of um, devices distributed across um, hundreds of thousands of properties compared to a smaller number of, of much uh, larger loads. So I think the kind of market for that kind of um, uh, device, that sort of technology really needs to grow. Um, what we're doing uh, now at Ripple is um, is kind of seeking to mobilize not just geographical communities but also communities of interest so uh, all across the uk there's there's individuals who are hugely concerned about uh, energy prices about oil dependence uh, and about climate change and by acting collectively and taking a real stake in generation they can make a, uh, a genuine difference to all those concerns uh, as well as starting to act flexibly to match their own generation and demand. Thanks Jamie and beyond community work how can consumers on an individual level be part of this transition? Farina I wonder if you could get started. Yep, sure I'm happy to answer that but I think just wanted to I guess just build on one of the points Jamie's made as well. I think fully agree. I think, you know, community energy has a lot of potential and really they've got a very key role to play. I think one of the things that we do have to recognize is, I guess, they don't have the same level of resource as, you know, some of the more, I guess, some um, commercial players might have in the industry. So, you know, it's really critical and important that, you know, we are working very closely with them and I guess, you know, making them a key part of that transition. So here at ENA, we facilitate um, community energy forums, I think specifically for that. So, you know, we help to bring them up to speed with what we are doing and, and you know, help to work with them on issues that specifically impact them. So I guess coming to, I guess, the, the other point, Molly, I guess your question really around, you know, how can we take consumers with us in that journey? I think I think there's going to be like, the, it, it's going to be really important to kind of educate consumers on, the options that they have i think particularly as you know there will be like some key decisions that will need to be made on things like you know decarbonization of heat i think you know as there is more clarity on the direction of travel on that alongside that there will be you know really like you know a need for us to kind of help you know educate them on the options that they have how they impact them and also to really understand their preferences because 
you know, in that decarbonization journey, you know, we've got to take the consumers with us on that. Thanks, Verena. David, I wonder if you're finding enough is being done to communicate the benefits of flexibility to consumers? Um, I think it's actually difficult to do that because most consumers are interested in just maintaining the status quo, um, particularly at the moment where there's high prices, they're, they're, they've got other drivers. So it's trying to get interest from the communities or for individuals. We're very lucky on Project Leo that we've got um, six or seven um, smart affair and neighborhoods identifying their local groups, community groups around Oxford that are looking to do something different, that are very proactive. And whether that is trying to maximize the use of capacity behind uh, a substation collectively, um, or it's trying to use more of the flexibility and the assets they've got within that community, um, or if it's actually just looking at how can they shift the pattern of what they do in order to match the pattern of generation, whether that's using flexible, using batteries or other um, devices. Um, and I think that will help. And I think we end up getting towards a smart community energy scheme where there's a there's a, an, organi an organization in a local area where all those people with MPANs, whether they are just domestic consumers or smaller users, SMEs, um, can work together with a collective need to try and balance their needs and to then interact with the network um, through the, the resulting flexibility that they've got at different times. Thanks, David. Um, I think now would be a great time to sort of start answering some of the questions that we've had in from the audience. Thank you, everyone who sent one so far. It looks like we're getting tons of engagement, which is great. So to start with, um, Andy Hawkins has asked, how do you see National Grid ESO's announcement of wanting to move to nodal pricing impacting the flexibility agenda? Is this a positive thing? Um, does anyone in particular want to jump in on that, Alistair? So I've been in rooms where the, the you've got real experts explaining exactly why this is a great idea and standing right next to them equally um, uh, um, well-schooled experts explaining why it's a terrible idea. Um, I think it's probably a good idea, but I think it's, uh, it's a, an, an implementation issue. I think um, uh, there, are, uh, there are issues around how you supply electricity to constrained areas and whether or not people in such areas are going to see their bills go up. Um, and uh, on the other hand, there's a substantial lift for those in areas of high renewable generation where they should be able to see value from the fact that they're living in a bunch of wind farms or solar farms. That's, that's a plus. Um, you, you also potentially see value in uh, flexibility at different locations appearing through these, these, um, these, these markets. So, uh, and there's lots of other more esoteric benefits around the establishment of a, a, a reference price um uh, against which contracts can be struck and these actually make a su surprisingly large difference to um how easy it is to actually create real value uh, for people so so on the whole yes i don't want to spend five years doing nothing else i don't want to, everyone to be locked away doing um vocational marginal pricing for five years and everything else be put on hold that would be really bad um but if we can to keep doing the day job and get lmp yeah probably comes out good I wonder if anyone on the panel has a different view. Does anyone think it's a negative thing? No? Broadly positive? Yeah. I suppose that answers that question. Um, so next, a question from Ollie Franklin. What does the panel think about the announcement last week regarding the publicly owned future system operator? How will this impact the range of flexibility markets and products? Uh, Farina, could you? Yep, I think from our perspective, I think we're certainly happy to see the announcement. I think, you know, it's, we welcome the clarity that we've got through that announcement. I think, you know, we're, um, you know, looking forward to working with Offshem and Bayes as part of that to help, you know, get the FSO set up in the right way. And I guess, you know, I think a key part of that will be, you know, I think there's still a lot of detail to kind of flesh out as part of that and making sure that, you know, there's appropriate stakeholder engagement and, you know, we're defining it in the right way. I think that's going to be, that's going to be a key priority. So yeah, very much welcome that. With the need for further detail, is there anything the panel would like to see in particular coming out of that when we find out more about how the future system operator will be run? But if I could, I'd, I'd like the, the, um, the crossover with, with, with gas is partial. Um, I think that there is value in exploring whole, whole, whole system. Um, mm -hmm. 
that's probably something where, where, where we could we could go further in, in time. What I would say though is the FSO announcement was well trailed. I was actually uh, I actually felt that um, an awful lot of what needed to be done was done when National Grid created ESO and um, separated the front doors and and, um, uh, and, and, and so forth. Um, it is, the FSO is is is, is great, but I'm I'm I'm, I'm not um, massively surprised. Um, I think the radical transformation that I didn't expect was um, UK Power Networks coming out and saying they wanted to do something equivalent with their own operation of their own system in the southeast of England. I, I thought that was massive mm -hmm. and much more surprising. And I would I would be keen to see that model um, uh, being looked at by the other DNOs. Absolutely. Uh, so the next question is from Kenny Cameron. Um, how do you think, how do the panel think that existing electric storage, heating and hot water load, 1.5 million homes, can be aligned with otherwise curtailed wind to decarbonise and el by eliminating supplementary heating and to alleviate fuel poverty as outlined by National Grid ESO in their 4D report? Alistair, I knew. Yeah, very interested in that question. Um, one answer is to the newly announced look at the state market, which picks up the Scottish end of that. Um, isn't that the, Scotland is not the only place where you'll, you'll find uh, uh, non-gas grid heating, um, but there's, there's quite, a, quite a lot here. And uh, look at the straight market for the, the B6 boundary, which basically means the Scotland England border, will create a potential opportunity for domestic customers uh, who are beyond that constraint, north of that constraint, as I am right now, um, to um, to, uh, uh, to participate in, in, in a flexibility service. There are some wrinkles in that pro proposition which do need to be removed for it, for it to, 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 to work. Um, but, I, but, I, but I believe that it can, and I believe that that would be transformative. Why am I so excited about that now is actually because of the, um, uh, the International Energy Agency's 10-point plan, which they, they wrote and published um, very shortly after the, the invasion of Ukraine, um, which, which um, created, actually exacerbated the gas prices we were already in, let's, let's, let's be clear. Um, that change in, in, in global affairs necessitates uh, action before next winter um, to address uh, the, the, the UK's use of natural gas. Um, because if we, if we burn less gas, the whole world market system situation becomes easier for everybody. Um, and so if we can properly put green energy to work in, resort, in, in constrained areas, um, such as uh, across that Scotland-England border, um, then we actually reduce the nation's gas burn overall because we don't consume that electricity later on when power might be flowing north or when less of it is being discarded. We, if we can use this local, local constraint market to create a means by which consumers are remunerated um, for shifting their consumption, charging their storage heaters, charging their vehicles, um, and, and, and do, do doing the other things that they can do um, to schedule their demand into the, the, the high renewable periods and the low demand periods within that constraint, then you will cut the, the nation's gas bill. And that's an enormously positive thing um, that we could be doing now. So we've, we've been pushing for that. We called it, nicknamed it Green Shift. And we've been pushing that to base, pushing it to, to, to ESO as, a, as an acceleration plan. Um, and that's why I'm delighted that Kenny asked the question. If if I could maybe just add a little to that, that I apologise if this is a slight tangent um, away from flexibility, but uh, I'm I'm hunting for a new house at the moment, and uh, it's not a good time to be looking for a new house. I have to say, um, one of the things that I'm constantly astonished by is how poor the the EPC ratings are on houses that have any form of electrical heating even those with heat pumps which are relatively well insulated can be really badly penalized by that and I strongly suspect we're we're not at all far away from the point where houses are going to have to meet a minimum EPC level before they can be sold for instance or or let um and so there will become rightly an incentive to improve thermal performance of homes but unless we um, reform the EPC system which is really badly flawed in a number of ways you're going to end up in the, the bonkers situation where people are being incentivized to put in a heat pump instead of um, particularly storage heaters um, which with a proper flexibility system and a proper market uh, could actually prove uh, 
an affordable and, and certainly a far greener solution than uh, than um, being forced onto potentially Russian gas. Absolutely. Um, so the next question is from Stacey Brentnell. How do the markets need to adapt to incentivize flexibility at the most efficient geographical locations to meet the planning strategy due out later this year? Uh, David. Um, I have to confess, I'm not sure about the planning strategy coming out this year, but I think um, certainly if you're incentivizing the local use of flexibility, um, they need to remember, they need to look at what kind of flexibility is being delivered and what benefits are being used, but also to look at how we can use that flexibility wider than just resolving local issues, but using it collectively to, whether it's a, the local is a, a community or a substation, um, but then use it for higher level use in the network. So whether it's for DNO services and then for ESO services. And I think looking at how you can stack services, how you can use it to save costs, to flatten your energy profile, and therefore reduce your price, your energy price, is all about how you can get more value for local flexibility. Um, but I'm not sure if that actually answers the question because I'm not sure about the, the planning linkage. No problem. Farina, I wonder if there was anything you wanted to add to that. Yeah, sure. So I guess a lot of the discussions we've been having so far, I think it's really about, I guess, what we call like, you know, procured flexibility that we get through the markets. I think there's also equally a role for implicit flexibility. And I think that's that's something that off are looking at through the access and forward looking charges review. I think basically people need to be incentivized to be using energy, I guess, at, at times when um, at times when, you know, it doesn't it put additional constraints on the system. So I think that's going to have a key role to play as well. I think when we talk about, when we look at flexibility as a whole and I guess how behaviors would need to change and evolve. Thank you. Uh, another question in from Yazan Abawi. Uh, any view on flexibility for battery storage systems? DNOs are currently considering import capacity under their security of supply demand group, and this is resulting in significant reinforcement work to be required. Um, Anyone want to jump in on that in particular? I'm happy to start, maybe. For any, you kick us off. I think, yeah, I mean, that is an issue that we are aware of. And I think, you know, it is something that we are like looking at closely to look at how we can perhaps, you know, either, you know, look at, I guess, change the way we approach, you know, how we do the calculations, I think particularly for stored battery storage systems and to look at how we can kind of, you know, I guess, get them connected to the grid a bit earlier. So I think that's all I can say on that at the moment, but it is, you know, um, something that we are looking at very closely and it is quite high on our priority list at the moment. Alistair, was there something you want to add on that? Very quickly, I think uh, that the, the DNO, DSO needs for, for, for flexibility services are very specific. Um, sometimes it's post-fault, sometimes it's pre-fault, sometimes it's long duration, sometimes it's short duration. Um, the the uh, where the need is for something of relatively long duration of, of, of a number of hours, um, why would that not be uh, one of the the, in, the introductory use cases that would actually get some of these um, long duration energy storage technologies up and running? Um, that would be great if, uh, if if the DNOs found themselves in a position to enable um, those those breakthroughs to happen. We had we've had um, two very credible long long duration energy storage projects come through the door of flexitricity in the last week alone um, and, and uh, these are these are technologies that i do believe in they're not high in the sky at all it'd be great if there was a use case in, in the d networks fantastic uh so the next question in from william goldsmith um from june this year all private charger points home and workplaces sold in the in GB must have minimum levels of smart functionality and the capability to provide DSR services. How do you think this will impact the domestic flexibility market? Farina? I think that's definitely something, I guess it's it's a great starting point and almost something essential that we need. You know, we need the devices, I guess, to be able to kind of provide that automated response that we need. But I think at the same time, like we do need to think about I guess how how you know users or I guess um, users are actually incentivized to be providing those signals back. So I think there is a key role I guess there in terms of how those you know price signals are passed back to the users of those um, you know EVs and, and how they incentivize to, to to change their behavior. 
I, I think as well from a from a consumer's perspective, what what I'm really keen to avoid is a, a really fragmented system where users end up locked into very proprietary technology. Um, so you buy you buy a, an EVSE from company A, you can only use company A's platform uh, for for DSM uh, services, um, and uh, or, or even if you change energy supplier, then that bit of kit becomes uh, becomes useless. Um, I'm I'm not a fan of <laughs> regulation uh, for regulation's sake, but I do think there is a real case. If this isn't happening already, and apologies if, if it is, uh, but a real case for manufacturers and the ENA, other stakeholders to to get in a room together and thrash out a, a universal set of standards. Because at the moment we have a lot of different stakeholders needing flexibility services, and there's no point in a local DNO coming up with um, uh, a set of um, standards that will allow them to curtail EVSEs in people's homes if the same system can't be used by ESO when there's a, when there's a national issue, for instance. Um, so I, I do think from consumers' perspectives, it's really important that the the right standards apply to uh, to these bits of kit to ensure that they can be used universally and that they aren't just locked into uh, one particular product or platform. Absolutely. David, I think you were about to say something and I know Alistair, you raised your hand as well. David? Um, yeah, I, th I would agree. I mean, we've, we've got experience of um, vehicle to grid chargers on Project Leo. Um, just some things to bear in mind that you can roll out the chargers you want, the smart chargers, they work great, um, but you need to get the users to plug their vehicles in so that you can use it. Um, there are some great tariffs out there, some innovation organizations coming out with some good tariffs, Optimist Energy's got. Um, and certainly we found that smart EV charging in its own right doesn't actually provide any value for services because the, the, the tariffs we're now seeing are too penal by comparison. However, if you were to use a time of use tariff together with some form of smart charging and using the vehicle for services, you start to get a very economic solution that can provide value. That's all I was going to say. Thank you. Alistair? Interoperability and uh, common standards uh, uh, for domestic smart appliances uh, are a uh, are major themes in the Smart Systems and Flexibility Plan, and we should absolutely uh, uh, get behind this. Um, the one thing that's not mentioned in that plan is the adoption of Code of Practice 11 for metering, um, and that's something that uh, device manufacturers basically need to download and read um, because that's uh, that sets the accuracy standards. Um, that if their devices meet those, then we can monetize the flexibility in those devices. So that's Electron's Code of Practice 11. Thank you. Um, so, a question from Alain Mallot. When will TSO DSO coordination in flex activation become real in the UK? Most EU countries take it as a foundation of flex trading, while it is reported to come in at a later stage in the UK agenda. Uh, Farina? I guess I might need a bit of help just understanding what specifically we mean by activation. I think generally, I guess what we are trying to do is we are trying to get more coordination more generally across you know um the eso and the dnos i think this is critical particularly like if we want you know to be developing local flex markets in alignment with the national markets that we have i think i might defer to some of the others just to understand the point around activation and maybe i can come back to that absolutely so if i could jump in uh, the coordination between dno and uh, uh, eso or tso uh, is something that's been talked about for far too long. We need to start doing it. It's 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 a uh, it's it's really um, uh, we did the five worlds. Uh, if, if people remember, I think uh, ENA Open Networks was was, was heavily involved in that. Um, we liked four of them. I think uh, one of them has emerged as a front runner. That process has happened. We've done that now. So maybe we could just get on and and, and, and implement these. It is time. I think we also need to just be careful though of um, uh, solving problems we haven't got. Um, it is it is it is not all about imagining the worst case that might happen in the future and legislating to prevent that from happening in the in, in, in the world in the, where we are now. I think we can see these things coming and we can plan for them. I, I think that prohibiting a whole bunch of stuff because of something that in some 
some conceptual future um, might become possible is, is, is the wrong way to do it. And that type of thinking, I think, has held us back for, for, for some time. I think the, <clears throat> excuse me, I think also um, the, the two of the projects we're working on are looking at some of these conflict management rules about conflict of use and about how you can prioritize access to services, to flexibility, but also how you can prioritize between peer-to-peer -peer services and DSO and ESO services. Um, and certainly, I know that um, the two projects are looking to support the ENO and their conflict management work to help advance some of that work and provide feedback and, and guidance and, and support and learning on that. Fantastic. Jamie, was there anything you wanted to add? All good. Fantastic. Uh, so a question in from Peter Lowe for Alistair and for David. And I know, Alistair, you've already touched on the bouncing mechanism, but Peter's asked, what else needs to happen with bouncing mechanism, wider access to enable more DERs to play a role in localised bouncing and what role ambition could DNOs play in this? I'll give a, I'll give a really short answer to this. Beyond, beyond um, the uh, unevenness in, in the BM wider access rules, this, this one is for the whole bouncing mechanism. Um, National Grid needs to deal with its IT and start using the offers and the bids that it gets in the BM in a, in a, a coherent way. Um, we, 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 um, they have done an awful lot of work, an awful lot of work in analysing what happens in the balancing mechanism. There's a huge data set. You can spend weeks and months in the, that data set understanding what's, what's, what's going on. Analysing is not the end. We then have to start fixing. Right now, we have a situation where, where, where ESO is saying, we'll spend the next few years working on IT to make dispatch efficient. That's, not, that's, that's fine, do that, but you can't um, live without some kind of way of dealing with it now as well. Um, as the situation is actually quite, uh, quite, quite urgent. Um, efficient dispatch and the balancing mechanism is an ESO problem and only ESO has the solution. I think um, beyond beyond the ESO, and I don't have experience with the balance mechanism at the moment that Alistair has, um, we've got to look at what's happening at the local level and looking at local optimization, local use of flexibility, and using that flexibility to resolve local issues and offset the issues that might mirror onto the national network. And I know there's some work going on at the moment with the ENA, certainly under product five that um, we'll get involved in, um, that will help to understand that. But I think we've got to look at how we can uh, create a local flexibility market so that organizations can participate in that either directly or through a third party. Um, so we can use that flexibility to resolve the issues, not just for the ESO, not for the DSO, but also for everybody that's connected to it so that they can trade their flexibility, they can trade their uh, capacity between one another so we can make more use of what we've got today without having to build more network at times. I think just to comment on that as well, I think, I think David made some of those points earlier as well. I think just thinking about about you know these local markets you know i think as we are kind of you know developing them we really need to kind of lower the, the thresholds for participation really if you if you want like smaller assets to play in these markets we have to make it easy for them to participate so you know things like i guess simplifying processes as much as possible standardizing them across gb i think those are, are going to be quite fundamental things for that and a question in from kieran williams what initiatives are there around utilizing blockchain technology for electrical distribution? Um, is there anyone in particular who'd like to talk on that? Can I give a slightly negative answer? Um, Go for it. I, I'm never madly in favor of uh, trying to overturn uh, a, a very well established system, except to the extent of improving it. Um, the, the electricity industry, the energy industry that we have in, 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 in GB is based on central trust. Um, a distributed ledger system has advantages and, and disadvantages, um, but the level of overhaul required, um, I, I, I can't see that it, that, that it provides the gains. I do know that, 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 that there are companies that have attempted to introduce distributed ledger technology into, into energy and most of them have actually backed away from it and gone, gone central trust. Um, I don't have a particular issue with central trust. I have a particular issue with um, uneconomic dispatch and barriers to entry that won't be resolved um, by a particular method of making a, making a market. But I've been wrong in the past about stuff and I'd be happy to be proved wrong by the distributed ledger. I think, I think the distributed ledger helps where you want to be able to verify the provenance of energy, either because it's traded, 
or because it's used for renewable certification. Um, and I know that's been, as you say, Alistair, has been trialled by a couple of organisations um, and certainly there are some behind the meter community type arrangements that are looking to use that as well. But again, it's about making sure we haven't got a sledgehammer to crack a nut. Absolutely. Um, one question in from, oh, sorry, Jamie, did you want to add in on that? No, but just very briefly to say, I, I would agree with both those points. I think also from a consumer perspective, if we're wanting to really um, uh, democratize this and, and make flexibility at consumer level as widespread as possible, you have to make it as simple as possible. And once you start talking about blockchain on top of some of the slightly kind of nebulous concepts of energy flexibility, you'll you'll start to lose some people and, and I'll be the first person to, <laughs> to to fall asleep when you start talking about blockchain, I'm afraid. So yeah, I would say use with caution. Definitely. Um a question from Rick Parfett. How long do the panel think it will take for time of use tariff rates to become competitive again, having become pretty unattractive during the current crisis? Is it just a case of waiting for them to settle down or is there something policymakers can do to help? Um, Farina? Um, I would perhaps maybe let somebody else start with that, but I think I do think like there is a lot of uncertainty at the moment. Um, I think, you know, we're, we're basically like, you know, we're, we're seeing like, you know, in a, pretty much an energy crisis. I think there's a lot of things we need to work through before we finally start to see time of use tariffs and other things, I guess, start to settle. Alistair? Just in the same way that, um, uh, the, you know, switching suppliers is now pointless because of the, the energy price cap. That's what's happened to, to time of use tariffs. Um, the, the, as I mentioned the fact that there's a cost of living crisis, that's what needs to be addressed. But I, I do also uh, agree very, very strongly um, uh, with, with, with um, points made by people like Clem Cowton and um, uh, uh, Flexibility First Forum as well, um, that there is a massive loading on, uh, on electricity. Every policy cost lands on electricity and very little of it lands on gas. Um, basically, electricity is the vector that enables us to green up the energy complex overall. And to say that's the place that all costs for, for green energy will be will be will be recovered, and um, simply burdens um, that and makes it, uh, it it exacerbates the the the, the it makes it it makes a higher hill to climb. It doesn't it doesn't help. So uh, addressing those two points, and that's right up at the level of of, of central government. Mm. So I suppose just to bring us back to the beginning of this session, uh, Farina mentioned earlier that the Open Networks is celebrating five years of the programme this year, and we've seen the sector change a huge amount since 2017. So in this vein, what is your top priority for the next five years? Uh, Jamie, could you kick us off? Sure, yeah. So we're we're really excited about what we're already able to to do for our members. Um, where um, if they log into their dashboard right at the moment, um, we can show them what their real time generation from their share of their turbine is, um, as well as what's what's projected and what's uh, what's happened um, in terms of past yield. And we want to build on that and be able to show um, their their live consumption as well if we can integrate that. Um, um, we're also working with SunAMP as part of a, a long duration energy demonstration project uh, to explore ways of linking members generation through demand side management to, uh, to heat storage to, to kind of further improve their savings uh, and, and to help um, provide grid benefits as well. We, we really want our platform to be technology agnostic uh, in terms of what DSM kit it can be integrated with. Uh, we're not tied to any particular suppliers. And so certainly if there's any in the audience, we're, we're really keen to, to speak to you about that. Um, our customers already have uh, very much above average uh, ownership of electric vehicles and heat pumps. So we do think that there's, there's real synergies for our um, consumer wind ownership model uh, with uh, the scope for um, improving renewable flexibility in the future. Thanks, Jamie. David? Um, for me, I think, I think there's two things. I think one is the creation of a flexibility marketplace that's neutral, um, fair and equitable, um, and that all people can access for all services. 
um, enabling easier access for market participants either directly or through third parties. And the second thing I think is that we realise that we need to reward flexibility fairly for the value they bring to GBPLC. And that's not just to the value to the person who's paying for the service at the time, because it does add additional things. And if we don't do that, I firmly believe we're not going to achieve net zero because we will not get the level of flexibility we want. Fantastic. Alistair? Uh, just, just as a, as a, as a, as a making point, I'd just like to pick up, there's, a, there's been a theme uh, uh, coming in the questions. I noticed um, Steve Broderick has asked quite a few questions, particularly that um, relates as a general theme towards security uh, and uh, uh, the protection of the system as, as, we, as we try to develop these. There's quite a lot of points he's made and I, I can't cover them all, but I think that um, uh, the, the, what, 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 what we need to recognise there is the, the importance of putting in place the various security standards, um, the various interoperability um, uh, uh, parameters, um, and basically working through that list of things in the smart systems plan properly and thoroughly. Now, we, among others in the industry, are already having meetings with people who don't have surnames, for example, in, in trying to uh, address the, the sort of cyber issues that, that have been raised. There's also the customer protection issues um, uh, uh, in there. All that has to be done. Why? Because my priority, my top priority in answer to your question is the advancement of domestic flexibility um, into the core markets, earning the core revenue that um, the industrial commercial and the merchants um, can already access. And Farina, for the Open Networks project, uh, what is your top priority for the next five years? I think it's really like, I guess, further developing those local markets for flexibility. I mean, yes, good progress has been made, but I think as the others have touched on as well, there is more to do. I think some of the key things, I think that the others perhaps have called out as well. I think the need for greater coordination across transmission distribution. I think, you know, that's, that's going to be a core area of focus for us. I think also looking at getting that flexibility down to residential level, I think as Alistair said as well, and then, you know, trying to get flexibility at an LV level as well. So I think those are going to be um, key priorities for us. Fantastic. Well, I'm sure it's gonna be a very interesting additional five years to the project. Um, I think we've got to call it to a close there. Thank you so much to all of our panelists for a really interesting conversation. As Alistair mentioned, there were a number of questions that we didn't manage to get to and apologies for that. Um, if you do reach out to us after the session, we will do our best to get an answer over to you. Additionally, the slides are available after this and a recording will go up on, on, current, on Solar Media's YouTube channel and also on current uh, in the next week or so. Um, I think that's everything. Thank you again to all our panellists and thank you to everyone who's joined us for the session. I hope you all have a lovely rest of your week and a very quiet and relaxing Easter weekend. Thank you guys.